showed you earlier. And this is called the M sigma correlation, so the black hole mass uh, velocity dispersion of the bulge of this correlation. So is this correlation uh, set up initially when the first black hole seeds form, or is this just a consequence of some late time activity that <coughs> is manifesting itself somehow as a correlation that lives right out to redshift zero? So one thing that we found quite early on and was first shown, uh, alluded to by Peng in a paper in 07, where basically the merging history of dark matter halos, so the paradigm here is a black hole is hosted in a dark matter halo which will also host the galaxy in whose center, in whose galactic nucleus this black hole will be sitting, right? And we know that galaxies merge, we know halos merge, galaxies merge, therefore their black holes that are hosted will also merge. So what you find is that the merging history of dark matter halos, which is entirely given by CDM, by the CDM power spectrum, that naturally provides a correlation. However, the slope and the scatter of that correlation depend on physical processes. And the physical processes they depend on are the formation of the first black hole seeds and feedback processes which is basically energy exchange processes in the gas from either stars or black holes and a detailed coupling of them. So this is sort of a buzzword at the moment, feedback. So the question if, if this is so, what are the signatures, right? And so one thing that got us started, um, one of my postdocs, Giuseppe Lodato and myself in 2007, 2006, 2007, uh, is we were looking really to come up with a theoretical way to start to make black hole seeds that was plausible in the very high universe, in the very early universe, that would set up an initial correlation. And the question is, if you start up with an initial correlation, does that correlation survive through just the merging history? Forget the gastrophysics. I mean, does it survive through just the merging history if we don't fold into, uh, uh, fold into um, the model, you know, gas accretion, some fraction is accreted, some fraction isn't accreted, et cetera, et cetera. So that was our original motivation. But before I move on to the model, let me quickly point out that, you know, there are very, fairly tight observational constraints. I mean, we do now see a lot of um, pre-merger binary black holes with the very various separations. They're now seen. Um, so we know that this merging story by and large has to work, okay? We may have the time, time scale slightly off, the efficiency slightly off, but by and large that picture works. But now what happened, as I mentioned, with the discovery of this entire population of high redshift quasars at redshift six or so by the SDSS, and they found roughly 10 um, in SDSS, about 20 in the Canada France uh, Hawaii Quasar Survey, and there was a record holder uh, which came out in June, was discovered in UKIDS this uh, summer, at a redshift of 7.08. So these luminosities uh, suggest basically that the black holes hosted in all these sources, not just one of them, most of these sources are about 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar masses already. And at this point, the age of the universe is only 0.77 giga years, less than a giga year, okay? So the, and these are just the tip of the iceberg. These are the brightest part of the luminosity function because these are very faint already. And so there's an entire luminosity function that is not accessible to us yet. So we extrapolate them in our modeling and so on. But these are just the tip of the iceberg. So there is a very large population that is sitting out there with a mass function that probably goes down in a couple of decades. But we do know that the upper end is about 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 already by redshift of 0.77. Uh, sorry, by redshift of uh, 7. And the number of E foldings, so if you remember my slide, first slide with uh, sort of back of the envelope numbers, the number of E foldings required uh, if the seed was the remnant of a first star, which is referred to as a population three, the first stars are referred to as population three, then you, ex you need about 25 E foldings within that time. So you need 25 mass doublings to happen. That's pretty rapid. And you need to be very steadily accreting at Eddington or Super Eddington the entire time, okay, from the Big Bang to 0.77 gig years. So that is a huge challenge, and it turns out that that mechanism, the mechanism of just having initial seeds come from the remnants of the first stars does not work. So you need something else. So of course you can say, well, 
every first uh, uh, black hole that is a stellar remnant from population three is accreting super Eddington from the beginning of time till about redshift to seven. To us, that's not a natural solution. And it turns out, actually, that people who've been doing these simulations of the first stars find that in fact, as, as they can model them better and better, when you form the first star and by the time you form the remnant, it's pretty hard to retain that remnant in the potential well. It can get kicked out, it can get kicked out. So it is not clear that you can hold this thing in place and keep dumping gas into it uh, and have you know, 25 mass doublings within this very short time. So here, um, there was another proposal that has been around for a while, which is the formation of more massive seeds perhaps rar rarer seeds, rarer than the population three. The population three roughly are sort of the 3.5, 3, 3.5 sigma peaks at redshift 20 or so where the first baryonic structures form, you form the first stars, so on and so forth. And these models, alternate models, uh, considered direct collapse of gas disks that had either local or global instabilities. But nobody had worked out dynamically what was the fate of those pre-galactic fat disks and what the fate of the, I mean, could you actually funnel in mass by some process to the center to actually form a seed black hole? That hadn't been computed because it's a detailed dynamical calculation involving a tough range of scales because the competition there is going to be between accretion onto a central object, a dense central object, so the formation of that object versus fragmentation en route. So if you fragment, you quench the accretion, so you don't actually st dump as much mass. So, and you need to therefore calculate this dynamically. So let me quickly show you sort of the theoretical ideas. So these ideas have been around as possible channels, many different channels to make uh, black holes. There's a particular sort of squ uh, squiggly diagram from Martin Rees. <coughs> so let me just <coughs> quickly give you the lay of land for what the properties are of the first objects that people have been looking at, um, primarily form, forming, uh, tracing the forma formation in high resolution simulations, uh, typically um, adaptive mesh refinement, using adaptive mesh refinement. So the first black holes that result from the possible uh, end states of the first stars are expected to have masses of the order of a few hundred solar masses. And the simulation suggests that this is looking at the baryonic collapse in the first halos that collapse. You have gas that collapses <clears throat> in there, forms the first star. And there have been many groups that have been working on this for several years, and we understand it reasonably well. And the primary limitation really had been computational. Whether you can actually, even with adaptive mesh refinement, whether you can actually trace right down into the detailed flows and determine the final mass. When does accretion actually stop and what is the final mass of the object that will form? So, so the initial claims were that these first stars have an IMF that is uh, biased high, so you have very massive stars that then um, give you remnant black holes. So as I mentioned, this mass range poses extreme challenges to explain the populations of high redshift quasars that we are starting to see. So a lot of work then sort of shifted into trying to make more massive seeds. And there were ideas about how you could have very efficient forms of angular momentum transport, so sh shuffling angular momentum out and mass in, in early unenriched pre-galactic disks. And so there's early work, uh, there was a paper by Eisenstein and Loeb in 95, called Shippers in 2004, where basically people exploited the fact that the first halos in CDM that collapse, in, in which gas collapses, are the low spin halos. So they are the most efficient sites for the formation of, of the first seeds. And so what we did, um, starting 2006, and since then we've been looking at this problem in detail, we started looking uh, much more carefully at the dynamics of these massive pre-galactic disks, the first baryonic structures that form in the halos, following them to see when they fragment, what the criteria are for fragmentation versus the essential accumulation of mass. So I just want to show that you know, there have been some very beautiful simulations, some very, very nice um, work. So let me quickly explain what our picture is. So it's a very, very simple picture. You have baryons that um, fall into a dark matter ha halo and form a rotating pre-galactic disk. And I say pre-galactic, um, what I mean by that is unenriched. So the only coolants in town are atomic and molecular hydrogen. So it's a very, very high redshift. 
So the disk becomes gravitationally unstable, it's globally unstable, it's Q unstable, tomb ray unstable, and it starts accreting to the center. And you form a central massive object, and you can calculate that the sequence of events is really, um, it's simple, and you can see that the parameters that really are relevant are the host dark matter, um, dark matter halo mass, the virial temperature, and since there are no metals, um, one just has to worry about two possible coolants, atomic and molecular hydrogen. One of them gives you a hot disk, about 4,000 Kelvin. The other one gives you a cold disk, which is about 400 Kelvin. And we have to dynamically trace what happens in these two sets of circumstances. And what we find is the criterion that determines whether the gas flows into the center and forms a central object or it fragments is primarily determined by the mass of the dark matter halo the spin of that halo and the ratio of the virial temperature to the gas temperature. And, and the way this dynamically proceeds is that you make, it's very familiar, you make these bars, um, you make these non axisymmetric structures which very efficiently transport angular momentum out and mass in. And you accumulate mass, you can actually calculate, I'll skip some of this because it's just giving you an idea of you know, the two different cases depending on the coolant. And the assumption here is, it is it's primordial cooling. So you can calculate the circumstances under which you would form a central object as opposed to fragmentation and possibly stars. So I want you to focus on the equation there. And so in such a model, in this kind of model, the central object, we are calling it a black hole. You know, uh, of course, we can never do it. We have, no one's done a simulation where can, they can track the formation of this central object down to seeing what its final total mass is. So what we have is an estimate for what the upper bound on what it's likely to be. And we find that the mass of a black hole that typically forms depends on the mass of the halo, that's the uh, uppercase M there, lambda, the spin, and I want you to really make a note of that because it's gonna turn up that what is special about this model is <coughs> the way in which Right at the initial conditions, the properties of the halo are intricately tied to the mass of the black hole seed that forms and the ratio of the gas temperature. <coughs> so it's just interesting to know that there are three sort of interesting regimes that you get where you have different fates and you can follow this and you can derive what the mass function of seed black holes looks like at about a redshift of 15 or 17 or something. And what is shown here in blue is the cold disk case when the disk is about 400 Kelvin or so. And the hot disk case is the uh, other diagrams. And what is shown in the dashed line is previous work where people have really uh, not worried, they have not dynamically taken into account the stability of this sort of pre-galactic disk. So there's something else that is different in this model as I mentioned and that is the dependence on spin. Okay, the amount of angular momentum. So in the models, we don't understand angular momentum well enough uh, to, to go beyond the assumption that the angular momentum of the halo is assumed to be the initial angular momentum distribution for the gas. Okay, the baryons have the same angular momentum as the dark matter is sort of the starting point. Okay? And that is the case for almost all cosmological work. And of course, as the system changes, as there's angular momentum transport, that is no longer the case. But initially, that's what is true. So what you see here is the mass function uh, on the x-axis is the mass of the central object that you can form. Notice that you can start forming seeds that tend to the four, tend to the five, tend to the six, there's a sharp cutoff. And that cutoff, it, 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 it turns out, is determined by spin. So what's different about this picture is that these holes are more massive, they are rarer, but the sites where they form are not always the lowest spin halos. There will be some halos that are median spin and high spin that, that can host a seed black hole. And this is going to be key to how you discriminate these two different models, especially even at low redshift. So there's a fragmentation threshold that I show you, showed you that comes from looking at global stability arguments. And then there's an argument that comes from the spin dependence of this picture. And so what you really find is that the black hole seed mass function depends quite strongly on the spin of the halo. Preferentially lower spin halos are the favored sites. However, you do have median spin and high spin halos as potential sites for the formation of seed black holes. So what does the mass function look like? So depending on the Q criterion, you know, ranging between say one and three, roughly, um, one can compute what the mass functions look like and what is shown in the histograms 
are the mass functions of the initial seeds from which you start this accretion story building, okay? At redshift 15 and at redshift 20. So that's what is shown here in the two histograms that you see. Okay, so uh, what do we do with this? So basically, the machinery that we have all been working with is, as I said, in the context of CDM models where there's hierarchical merging uh, of halos of galaxies and their black holes. And so what we are doing now is through this merger tree with a very basic set of assumptions about how gas is accreted on, um, you can propagate it forward, and this is sort of the continuity argument sort of way of building an accretion history for a population of black holes. And what we do is we start out with an initial distribution that looks like either, so the red histogram was the initial seeds from population three remnants. And what this model gives you, notice the x-axis, this is a broader spread, and so you get a few massive seeds, and you have a mass function which is a lot broader. Okay, so that's what this model provides. So what we do now is starting with these initial seeds, we propagate them over time through a merger tree, merger, merger tree being the merger history through of dark matter halos. And, you know, and there are some uh, assumptions that we make that the, the massive black hole merges are actually quite rare events. And the reason they are rare is that if those of you with very good eyesight would have noticed that this is early times, this is late times, so this is the assembly history at the late time uh, of a galaxy like the Milky Way, for example. Notice that at early times, not every little halo is actually populated by a black hole. It doesn't have to be. Not every he halo needs to be initially seeded. A fraction of them, and it turns out the fraction is about a fifth or less need to be seeded in order to reproduce all the observations that we see locally. That's all one needs. So we assume that these mergers are actually very rare events, and we uh, work within the framework that the merger actually triggers an accretion episode, and you have a growth spurt for a black hole, and that's how you assemble this mass. And, you know, and we can make a whole host of predictions now because we have a model, we have a population, we can predict all the properties of this population as a function of redshift in wavelengths, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we find to just give you, so this is what many, many Monte Carlo realizations of the merger history of a present day 10 to the 13 solar mass halo, something that could be hosting a galaxy like a few times as massive as the Milky Way. What you find here, I've shown you the slices from redshift four down to redshift one. What is shown in red is the local M sigma relation. So at very early times, the massive seed model, which is shown here sort of in this green sort of lump here, the massive seed, uh, seeds are sitting above the local M sigma. So the way the black holes in this model, if you want to understand the results, I'm trying to give you a little bit of a preview of why you're going to get the prediction that you're going to get um, in a couple of slides from now to give you a physical feel. So what's really happening in the massive seed models is that you are over massive compared to local M sigma to start with. So what needs to happen is the holes don't grow very much initially. The stellar component assembles first because we see everybody sitting on M sigma at late times, right? So the sequence of growth, the sequence of whether the stellar component and the black hole grow in tandem, whether they go co whether or they grow in sequence is different in these two models. And, ooh, okay, I am gonna go a little over time, okay. So obviously of great interest is the fact that because the mass functions are so different, the initial mass functions for the seeds are so different, very important consequences for what we might see as gravitational wave signatures when the mergers do occur, right? Because the mass ratios, everything is different for this model. And so we have predictions out for LISA, and there are many, many more events um, for the massive seeding model compared to the population three. So that would be a very important test, and I'm really hoping it happens in my lifetime. Who knows? Okay, so what is the key prediction of our model with a completely different way of making the initial seeds? So notice the three panels mark Q1, 2, 3 are the massive seed models. And what is plotted there as crosses are data. This is the local M sigma relation. I've removed the beautiful ellipses and now you just see the arrow bars. And what you see are the predictions of these models. Uh, and population three is the remnants of the first stars. So notice right away that our models do not 
predict, they predict a flattening of the M sigma at low sigma. And here, you know, it's 50, this, you know, um, the axes were very crowded, but the sort of the low mass halos, the 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, more massive than the Wimpy dwarf galaxies, but just slightly more massive, we think that they should be a lot more scattered in the relation at the low mass end, and that the relation should flatten, whereas the population 3 one is pretty steep at the low mass end. So the question is, what does the data look like? Okay. So there was a very recent survey from reverberation mapping. These masses were determined. And this particular plot from um, Jenny Green and her collaborators shows that essentially these are the low mass black holes for which they have estimates. And this is now um, it sort of plotted not in terms of sigma, but the luminosity. Remember I told you that the, the correlation is both with the bulge luminosity and the velocity dispersion, but it's just tighter with the velocity dispersion. So it just shows you here that, um, so they have statistically significant evidence that the relation actually um, flattens. This is something that the population three model cannot give you. There's no tuning that you can do. So the question is, what are the other observational indicators? Are there other signatures that tell you that you need more than one way to make the first black holes? Um, and so one interesting argument is the uh, regulation, as I said, this feedback. And what a simple argument can be made, uh, and you can see that if the radiation pressure is high enough that it can unbind the gas that is sitting right around the black hole, you could quench the accretion onto the black hole. And you could evacuate a large area of gas such that the time taken for the gas to refill that cavity is much longer than the age of the universe at that time, or it's much longer than the rate at which a merger is going to happen and refuel that region. And what you find is that automatically gives you an upper limit at every redshift for a given galaxy for a, for a black hole that can form in it. And the question is, is there evidence for such a self-regulation? So recently uh, we published a paper where we showed with sources from the Chandra Deep Field South from X-ray data that you actually need, even if you somehow force fit the population three model, you need to have some kind of self-regulation in order to match the observational limits at the moment. Okay? So there are hints that you have both from the low redshift signature, low mass, low redshift signature, and as we will see in just a moment, there's a very distinctive signature at the high mass end of the local black hole mass function that also tells you something about the seeds. So um, as I said, there's an upper limit. So the question is, what does that mean locally? What it means locally is other than the extrapolation, than the mere extrapolation of the M sigma relation to higher velocity dispersion bulges. So the highest velocity dispersion bulges locally are CD galaxies that are sitting at the centers of clusters. So those should be the sites for the formation of the most massive black holes. So we made a prediction um, in 2008, 2009 that, the, that there should be a population of ultra massive black holes, black holes with masses in excess of 10 to the 10 solar masses that should be preferentially sitting in CD galaxies. But more than that, we because of the way in which the spin matters in the formation of the initial seeds in this model, we predicted so we did predict the two candidates where we thought that you should find ultramassive black holes, and they were discovered and recently reported. So in addition, we have also predicted, because of the way in which spin is coupled into the whole black hole growth process, that there should be some CD galaxies with incommensurate mass black holes. And that should be an indication of differential spin of the halo that contains information. So not just a mere extrapolation of the M sigma, but there actually should be some cases where the black hole masses that you measure locally in very bright bulges are incommensurate with M sigma. And if you find one of those, that would be a really good test of our picture. We should find a couple of those. Okay, that's a prediction that we've made. So I just have a last couple of slides to uh, finish up. So the question is, you know, I made this fuss and said, well, you know, it's, it's really the stuff that's at redshift six and eight, so, um, and we started seeing them in the optical. So what do we, do we have any evidence from other wavelengths? So it turns out that recently, stacking data from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field um, and the overlap with the Chandra Deep Field South, looking at the galaxies 
that were photometrically determined to be at redshifts greater than six, we stacked the Chandra sources in those locations. There is no individual detection, but we do find a statistical detection in the stack in the hard band. And you know, the, 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 the level of statistical significance is disputed, so Kawi and his group think that you know, we overestimated. Um, um, and it, it, this is tricky territory. No one really knows how to stack X-ray data. And the, the trickiness has to do with the fact that at Redshift 6, you need to fold in a model for everything that you know is along the line of sight. Everything that's obscured, that can contribute to the stack. So how you remove that contamination by known populations of AGN at lower Redshift is where the difference is in the various people who've looked at this data set. But what is very interesting, is um, this is a little Zoom movie that NASA made this summer, which is you know much nicer than anything that I can make. And this is uh, this is real data. This is zooming into the Chandra Deep Field and just giving you a visual sense. So what you see as the blue dots are the locations of sources that have been photometrically galaxies in the Hubble Deep Field, ultra deep field that have been determined to be at redshifts greater than six. So then we went and stacked them in the X-ray, and so this is just shows you the detection. So let me just wrap up with telling you, how do you, okay, so I've given you this heuristic picture. You have this fat disk. It forms these initial seeds. How does it really work? Does it really work in simulations? Can you, can you, do you get those outcomes that I was claiming? Do you get those scalings? So this is where I'm going to wrap up. I'm sure you that work, you know, we're furiously working away trying to uh, do simulations with state-of-the-art uh, techniques and, uh, and and you know, humongous computing resources to see if we can actually shore out the dependencies that we have claimed should be for the, you know, the dependence on lambda, the dependence T virial, the dependence on T gas, and so on and so forth. So one of the new things that we have done, actually my student, Andrew Davis, who's now postdoc at the Max Planck Institute, did for his thesis was to start looking at the median spin and high spin halos. So not the first collapsing halos in the universe that tend to be lower spin, but looking at the median high spin halos following baryonic collapse in those halos. And no surprise, we find very different outcomes from what the first star people found. And the reason for that is that we find fragmentation much, much more readily depending on the criteria. So remember that these criteria that determine whether something's going to fragment or not. So we're really at the brink of kind of quantifying what this criteria, we're doing many runs at the moment. Um, and what you find is that gas collapse, baryonic collapse, and the fate of these fat disks in median and high spin halos, high spin regions of the universe, is very different from the low spin halos, which has been the focus of all the first star work so far, okay? So we're showing that in the first star work, as I said, people thought you had one very massive object, now maybe a cluster of them. We find that inevitably in these halos, whole range of outcomes, depending on various criteria, spin as well as temperature and mass of the halo. So sometimes you fragment, sometimes you form a very dense central object, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to stop with this movie, which is a zoom in of one of the runs of the highest spin halo, a halo in which this, the, we, we used a parameter called lambda that measures the rotational support in a halo. Um, and this is a halo which is about 20% rotational support. So that's a very extreme part of the spin distribution of dark matter halos. So most dark matter halos in, the, um, in simulations appear to have a distribution in this parameter lambda, which, um, which is a measure of angular um, momentum support, uh, which is distributed as a log normal distribution with a median of about 5%. So 20% is really quite a ways out. So this guy is a very extreme halo. And what we did is, is we picked up and we zoomed in on a high spin region in the universe and followed baryonic collapse. And you'll see, I mean, it's, it's a nice little movie, but you don't, ext you don't see a spectacular bang at the end or anything. I mean, you know, just sort of, this is where it's at, right? I mean, the, the simulation is still running uh, in Pittsburgh, so I should, we should probably have nicer slices in a couple of months. But um, what I really want to end with is this slide to give you a sense of the progress. And, and to kind of make a pitch for getting everyone in the field um, in galaxy formation and then studies of black hole growth to start looking again at spin and angular momentum. It's a property that we have not understood very well. And we've made some very simple assumptions. Uh, and I think that 
This is a demonstration of how taking it into account in the simplest possible way can give you some very, very interesting observational constraints. So I just want to show you here that, you know, angular momentum has both magnitude and direction, right? So it turns out that the, there's a lot of misalignment between the gas and the dark matter in these inner regions in these very high spin halos. I mean, there's a lot of scatter even in the low spin halos, but there's a lot more scatter in these high spin halos in the directions. There's a lot of divergence in the directions of the angular momenta of the dark matter component and the gas that's collapsing in that halo. And we see first hints of a criterion that we may be able to develop. We don't have enough runs for me to make a claim that you know, we can verify the model that, that we sort of proposed. I think we're on our way to try and see what elements of that model might work. So I hope I've given you a sense that there is a very compelling need uh, to come up with new ways to make the first uh, black holes in the universe. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. This uh, uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is about the halo spin and its effect on the baryonic inflows in the spin shell well. Now, of course, the baryonic flow, that would have a spectrum of angular momentum. So those which have high angular momentum, of course, will form the, the disk, disc. the pre-galactic yeah. disk. Yeah. But the those which are radiated, they'll probably contribute to a higher growth of Absolutely. So is this yeah. spectrum of angular Absolutely. momentum taken into account? No, so that cannot be analytically taken into account because you have to make further um, assumptions on fluid low, flow about what fraction flows in and, um, and what the initial angular momentum distribution. So we've just made an assumption here for the initial angular momentum distribution. And as you say, it's going to get modified very, very rapidly. But these simulations take that into account mathematically because these are cosmologically correct. So these are regions that we have zoomed in from a larger cosmologically correct set of initial simulation with cosmologically correct set of initial conditions. So we've just sort of zoomed in. So that takes into account all the flows from the outside. And if you have these sort of filamentary flows, these so-called cold flows, you don't really expect them at these high redshifts, perhaps. But you know, if you do have collimated flows coming in along filaments in particular directions, and I think one of the simulation slices that I showed you visually suggests that those kinds of flows must be important. The question is what fraction of the mass is, you know, what, what is the distribution of angular momentum with mass after, so very, after the very early start? And that is taken into account only in the simulation, not in the analytic model. You're right. The second was about the CD galaxies. Yep. Now, observationally, how many uh, data points are there concerning the supermassive black hole at the center of CD galaxies and the uh, velocity dispersion? The well, one that half of CD galaxies is the cluster cooling flows would disturb the bulge component, and one would not expect a tight correlation. So what is the observational right, so uh, now? There, there has been an observational campaign that has been aggressively followed by the Newker group that was looking at um, isolated galaxies and dynamical modeling. So these people have been doing dynamical modeling of stellar orbits in the inner regions of galaxies, and they're trying to do the same thing. It's much more challenging, as you point out, for CDs. So they've been looking at CDs um, in which the cooling flow rates, the gas inflow rates, are low. They've been looking at the low and, and the success. So as I said, there's a recent success was reported, I think less than about a week ago or something, in two cases. Um, and the campaign is ongoing. And there are sort of preliminary measurements. Um, you know, I'm not sure the measurements are as robust, but the indications, I mean, I'm willing to buy. I may not buy the actual value, but I'm willing to buy, as I said, that their masses have to be in excess of 10 to the 10. And I think that, that's definitely um, robust. 
whether it's 2, 2.5, 3. Last week, yeah, I saw that, yeah. You are, I, I know you were on the list, yeah. So, so in, in this, in the, uh, the simulation shows that in the rare uh, uh, pragmatic, uh, like four, five sigma, uh, halo potential six, uh, so delivery of the whole yard from the outskirts of something with one video radius is very efficient in a whole phase. And uh, uh, regarding speed distribution, it is important, uh, not just in the distribution, but also distribution uh, where gas is in a region of crash with low spin. High, high spin, yeah. And so in the region of the crash with low spin gas, which has an opportunity to go straight to the bulk, and build, build bulk without overfilling the intermediate field. So this appears, but it's very really, uh, weak and uh, destroyed, with kind of with this, uh, each of the collapse of the shot very quickly. And so we build actually uh, quite the bulk with the low momentum gas. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a very, very nice paper, as I said. So one of the issues, right, uh, as I said, in these sort of models, I gave you the brush, broad brushed picture, and they're like details that a lot of people are working in at every epoch. I mean, we've worked at very low um, redshift because it's just easier to look at mergers and gas disks. And there's this very, this, in this very nice paper, I think one other thing that they do show is the point that I alluded to saying, it's not clear what the sequence of star formation and black hole growth is, whether they're coeval, whether they are subsequent to each other, and the fate of, and that sequence may depend on spin, entirely depend on spin. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, but, but it's very important to highlight the issue of the spin, and uh, in particular, the special disagreement of spin in the collapse of yeah. Yes, next. Hello. Um, what you have to say about the, the so-called Bollinger's galaxies and in, in what is the consequence for what you have been uh, sure. talking about? Sure. Great question. Yeah. So our, our prediction of the massive seed model would be that the bulgeless galaxies actually don't have black holes. I think that uh, uh, some bulgeless galaxies have some signatures I agree, but I think it's not settled whether that flux is actually from AGN or star formation. Would you agree? It's not settled. Yeah. But our model would predict that the bulgeless galaxies would preferentially be the sites where you don't have any black holes. Because neither, the, neither do you have them initially, nor do you manage to populate them through the merger. That's sort of what we find in our models. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's what exactly. So that's what I was alluding to when I said that locally, even at the high mass end, although um, one expects quite naturally, it's not surprising that you should find a few guys that are 10 to the 10 solar masses. I think uh, and we predicted that, but I think the interesting part of our prediction, which can be quite easily verified, is that there should be a flattening at that end as well. So you should find a CD galaxy with an incommensurate mass with a lower mass black hole than you would expect from just the M sigma. So there should be outliers there as well. And I think there's a systematic survey that's ongoing. So once you know, uh, we have more results, I think uh, you know, the verdict on that particular prediction will be out. Thank you, thank you, speaker, the next one. Okay. Sorry. okay, right. I think I can hear myself, so I hope you can hear me. Uh, I just need um, <laughs> some slides. So, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I mean, it's my thanks to the organizers for the chance to, to talk this morning, but also just for the chance to be here. Fantastic setting, especially in the middle of winter. And, uh, and I think it's been a memorable conference. Uh, I've really enjoyed excellent talks. 
Um, and of course, I've enjoyed the fact that quite a lot of the talks have been uh, referring to primordial non-Gaussianity, a uh, topic close to my heart. So um, I'm going to tell you, got the opportunity to tell you a bit more about that uh, this morning. So the starting point, of course, is this uh, beautiful view of the cosmic microwave background sky and uh, the standard, new standard model of cosmology um, given to us by uh, Ichiro Komatsu and his uh, collaborators in the WMAP team, combined, of course, with, uh, already here this is combined with uh, ground-based CMB, as well as combined with the large-scale structure data from galaxy surveys that we have, which fit, more or less, with this uh, very simple picture of the primordial universe uh, and small density fluctuations, one part in 10 to the 5, almost Gaussian, almost uh, adiabatic as far as we can tell, and extending in an almost scale invariant spectrum. And here's the picture of the, the power spectrum uh, mapped from super horizon scales down to uh, arc minute scales and now beyond from, uh, from ground-based observations. And the, uh, of course, with that, uh, we can map, try and connect that with our models of the early universe um, using quantities such as the, the spectral tilt, uh, possible deviations somewhere around about the t beyond the two sigma level maybe uh, from the simplest uh, scale invariant, absolutely scale invariant case. We can also constrain the amplitude of gravitational waves. And these are um, important constraints uh, on inflation models, models for the origin of structure as uh, in, in, in the very early universe. And uh, as I say, they're effectively apparently Gaussian to a, to a high degree, the fluctuations we see, and that fits very well with the picture that these fluctuations should have emerged from inflation, um, in that uh, if, if, these, if the st structure we see originates actually from vacuum fluctuations in an effectively free field, then a, a free field in De Sitter um, acquires um, a Gaussian distribution of fluctuations on super Hubble scales. And that's consistent then with this being the sort of ground state of the, the free field, which, like a simple harmonic oscillator, has a Gaussian distribution. And in a De Sitter space, for a free field, we would have a s scale invariant um, spectrum. So that's probed through the, the power spectrum, right? So this is, in Fourier space, the two-point function. Um, and uh, as I say, it's consistent with n being close to one. Um, but, and that was the starting point, really, for motivating models of inflation. But uh, we've become very adept now at producing that great variety of models of inflation that Francois Boucher listed up, where many of which we can produce very similar power spectra, um, even similar tends to scalar ratios for, for different classes of models. And so in the last few years, there's been a lot of interest in non-Gaussianity and non-linearity as a way of getting more information to distinguish these models. And so I'll be talking about looking at the higher order correlators to try and distinguish different models, quantities such as the three-point function or the bispectrum in, in Fourier space. Because non-Gaussianity non is telling us about the non-linearity uh, in the model, and so we're looking now at the inter interactions of the system, the fit of the physical model or the and gravity, of course, in the early universe. So these are just some of the sources of non-Gaussianity. If I come down here, I can see it properly, um, and uh, that one can go through, starting from really the initial state. What is the initial vacuum state? Uh, of, of the small-scale fluctuations before they get stretched up by inflation. Um, does, do theories like loop quantum gravity tell us more, give us a different uh, initial state? Um, there's been, and down here, so these, as I say, these are just some of the many sources of inflation, and these are some of the many talks and posters that I've managed to spot on the subject at, at just at this meeting. Um, then, as those fluctuations, uh, perturbations, those vacuum fluctuations get stretched 
Um, while they're still within the Hubble scale, you can get interactions between different modes. Now, for cano cano canonical scalar fields, um, in slow roll, those, those um, interactions would be suppressed. But if you've got higher derivative terms in your Lagrangian, as in K inflation, DBI models of, uh, in, uh, of brains moving in higher dimensions, or recent work on Galileans, this produces self-interactions of the field on sub-Hubble scale. Or you can have features in the, in the potential localized uh, in Fourier space at Hubble exit. Or you can get the super-Hubble evolution, nonlinear evolution of the modes on very large scales. Um, either during inflation or at the end of inflation, nonlinearities in the in tachyonic instabilities in some models like hybrid inflation, preheating, the rich dynamics of, of the reheating process at the end of inflation, which Dick Bond talked about, or fields decaying after inflation. The presence of magnetic fields is likely to, 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 to be associated with non-Gaussianity. When you turn a, even if you turn a Gaussian magnetic field into a, a, and look for the imprint on the CMB sky. And then, all of that is what I would feed into the context of primordial non-Gaussianity. Uh, beyond that, of course, there's the non-linearity inherent in the process of last scattering of the, C of the CMB photons, that plasma. So there is going to be non-Gaussianity even, even if the fluctuations don't come from inflation at all. There's just some God-given initial uh, spectrum of fluctuations. If they happen at very early times, just as modes re-enter the horizon, there's an intrinsic non-linearity. And that's uh, a, a, a important case, and, and there's a lot of uh, important work going on on that subject to actually develop second-order uh, Boltzmann codes in the same way that we've become familiar with using uh, for studying first order, the, the power spectrum of the CMB. Uh, and then, of course, there's foregrounds, which are going to be non-Gaussian. So, let's see if I can go on. So, there's a great variety of, just as there are lots of inflation models, there are lots of sources of non-Gaussianity. So, aren't we getting into even more trouble? Well, the hope is that with the, the, the possibility that it's really opened up by looking at the higher order correlators is you've now got a lot more information than just one power spectrum. Even the bispectrum, even before we go on, on to higher correlators, have different shapes. So, so we have, uh, and the, for instance, the super Hubble evolution produces this local type evolution, of which I'll talk more about. Um, local in real space means that it's, it reaches a peak for triangles with a squeezed configuration. So this is also called the squeezed type uh, bispectrum. The sub-Hubble interactions typically give you, uh, produce modes, uh, <laughs> interactions between two K modes produce a third K mode with a similar K, so it peaks in equilateral configurations. Then there are combinations which are, some of which have been deliberately constructed so that they're orthogonal, independent statistics to the other two, and you can look to see whether your models produce this. And so, you know, if you go back to that list, we heard about these, the, the theoretical origins of these models, but we also heard about what shape they predict, what, you know, what their prediction is for the shape of the bispectrum. So, lots of information to be had. Now, so, uh, so far I've really been talking about field fluctuations and inflation, but of course ultimately we want to test these against the structure we see either in the CMB sky or the large scale structure of galaxy surveys. So we need to turn turn quantum field fluctuations into density perturbations. And uh, a useful way to think of that, I think, is in, 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 in this prescription, which I'll call the, the delta N prescription, really, for what the initial curvature perturbations are. So zeta is, is one of the many gauge invariant quantities you could construct at first order and at higher order in perturbation theory. Um, and it turns out to be a useful, familiar one to work with. It corresponds to, um, it's either a density perturbation on spatially flat hypersurfaces, or in this case, we can usefully think of it as equivalently as a dimensionless curvature perturbation. So, so the curvature, that's the spatial three curvature on a uniform density hypersurface in the primordial radiation dominated era. And we want to work out that quantity, that primordial density perturbation from initial fluctuations at an earlier time on this 
hypersurface here uh, during inflation. And the standard calculation of field fluctuations during inflation is done in terms of the, the free field fluctuations on a spatially flat hypersurface. So to work out the curvature perturbation at later times on large scales, this is eff effectively just the exp integrated expansion along the world lines from an initial unperturbed hypersurface. So we just need to work out n, the integral of the local Hubble rate against the local time along different world lines from an initial, field, initial time during inflation, and we'll have some distribution of field fluctuations here, and we'll evolve that forward to a final, final time, a final spatial hy hypersurface of uniform density. And this is simple in many cases on large scales. Um, in linear theory, but in fact it's been shown beyond in, in the nonlinear perturbation theory as well, that we can just, so under, obviously under some restrictions where we're neglecting spatial gradients and isotropies, but these often turn out to be small for the scales of interest for our large scale structure today. We can evolve forward the initial data simply using the, the background Friedman, Robertson, Walker uh, cosmological equations. So this is, if you like, what I would call the separate universe approach. I've got remote control, let me go. So then zeta is, so as I say, zeta is simply the difference between the local expansion along each world line and, and the average expansion uh, as a function of the initial field values. So we can ex simply expand this out as a, as, a, as a Taylor series and most of work, you know, I mean, until recent years was based on just the linear term and the expansion. You just needed to know the n by d phi for a given field fluctuation delta phi at each point x. Um, but that can, can be expanded beyond. So this is work, you know, this is an idea which has been developed by many authors, I think, over, over time, probably starting with, with Starobinsky's uh, paper in the mid-80s looking at just single field linear perturbation theory in single fields, but um, Dick Bond with David Salopek used the similar sort of uh, intuition, as Dick was talking about, log A as being the, the perturbation in log A. That's exactly what this N is here, log of the scale factor. Um, back in 1990, others extended it to multiple fields to, um, uh, to nonlinear, non -linear, well, uh, some of these works are nonlinear non -linear theory. And the state of the art, uh, you know, would point you towards, if you're interested in following this up, is the work of Filippo Venizzi, who's here, with David Longlois, who produced a very nice covariant uh, 3 plus 1 sort of formalism for, for studying uh, zeta and defining it non-linearly. Yes, that's right. So it's, the, it's I think it's, I think it's a simple way to think of the, how, how how perturbations are produced on large scales, and it's useful I think also in terms of the discussion of non-Gaussianity. If we start looking order by order, we can split the sources of non-Gaussianity in, in general into two two sources: either the non-linearity in the initial field perturbations, so delta phi, are sp split up into delta delta one phi. The, Gaussian free field, and then the higher order perturbations, and then the, the not d curvature density perturbation zeta that's produced at second order now has a bit which is, of course, a linear coefficient, the n by d phi times that intrinsic nonlinearity of the field and higher order terms, and you also get a bit which is the second order dependence of the expansion and the quadratic in the local field values, and so you can sort of draw that in diagrammatic form here, the, the, the two different contributions, for instance, to the bispectrum. And of course, you can use this for higher order terms as well. So the, as I say, the first term is effect generally due to sub-Hubble interact, self-interactions of the field. Uh, and the second term figure here is due to the nonlinearity in the field evolution, just which is present even if the field fluctuations themselves are Gaussian. And that's the interesting special case that goes by, in the simplest case, by the name of a local form of non-Gaussianity, where the expansion, and therefore zeta, is just a, a local function of actually a Gaussian field fluctuations. If you have no, neglect the self-interactions of the fields during inflation, then all you need to worry about is the non-linearity in the evolution in expansion n. 
And so then if you expand out, uh, well, here's the two-point function with the usual leading term with the linear coefficient. But the three-point function now, if you expand it out for zeta, you get term, the correlation of delta phi, delta phi, and delta phi squared, which you can split up into the product of two two-point functions. And the classic uh, parameter that you hear about in um, non-Gaussianity uh, talks is FNL, and it's simply the coefficient in these simple, lo sim in these local models in particular, it's the coefficient between the, the three-point function and the product of the two-point functions. And the odd factor of three-fifths that you might see s s s distributed through the talk here is simply because the definition I'm following goes, follows from uh, Ichiro Komatsu's work back in 2001 with Dave Spurgel, where they were working in terms of the Newtonian potential in the matter era, which is three-fifths of, of zeta, of my zeta. So um, when I write it in terms of zeta, I've got to include factors of three-fifths. Um, but uh, let's not worry about that. Um, of course, we can keep going. Um, the FNL term just comes from the uh, second order term in an expansion. So similarly, even with Gaussian field fluctuations, if we go up to the cubic term, there's a coefficient, let's call it GNL, in, in front of the zeta cubes. And that gives a contribution now to the, to the four-point function at, at tree level in, in this diagram here. You've also got a contribution, so this is the four-point function now, it's called the tri-spectrum in Fourier space, and we've also got a contribution which is, if you can see, it's like a product of two terms, uh, two bispectrum terms here. So in fact, there's this tau and L coefficient, which is actually, in these single source models like this, is simply uh, equal to the square of F and L. And actually, I've dropped my factors of, there are numerical factors here that I've dropped. But it's effectively the square of F and L. And these are two contributions to the, tr so now you've got two parameters, but they've got different shapes, different momentum dependencies. So you can, in principle, distinguish between these two shapes. And, uh, and in particular, there's, you can test this consistency relation for single source models of uh, non, local models of non-Gaussianity. Tau should be the s square of F and L for a single source. And in the multi-source model, if you sum over many Scale, more than one scalar field propagators in this diagram, you actually get a consistency relation becomes an inequality that tau and L must be greater than F and L squared. Uh, for any local type model of non-Gaussianity, any model of non-Gaussianity arises, in this local form arises as we've seen from the super Hubble evolution of initial Gaussian fields. So you've got these many parameters and consistency relations between broad classes of models. So, what does inflation actually predict? Um, well, the thing that has to be said is that the standard single field slow roll inflation models that most of us worked on until, you know, through the 80s into the 90s, single field slow roll inflation models, if you work out F FNL local, um, it's actually suppressed by slow roll parameters. It's much less than one, which makes it effectively undetectable as far for anything we can dream up at present. Um, and that's simply by, if you can see that in the local case, just by taking the second derivative of n compared to the first derivative, and that's of order of Cylon. Because in inflation, single field inflation, you can do this calculation at horizon crossing, because zeta becomes constant after a mode's moved into the super Hubble regime. So you actually don't need to know about the reheating, preheating of the universe on the large scales. Um, because you know, in these single field models, one seat is constant on large scales. And in fact, so that general, that, that general rule allows us to say actually for any model that's producing adiabatic perturbations in the super Hubble regime, so zeta is constant on large scales, that means that the um, can relate the bi spectrum, 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 can relate the bi spectrum spectrum in the super Hubble regime. So zeta is constant on large scales. That means that the um, local non-Gaussianity is always can be rewritten um, proportional to the tilt of the power spectrum. It's because the, 
the three-point function in this squeeze limit, the one of those modes looks just like a perturbation of the background, so you can relate the bi spectrum to the to the tilt of the spectrum. And that we measure, this is something we actually do measure to be to be bounded and small. So we expect in a very broad class of models, adiabatic perturbations produced during inflation that FNL in the squeeze limit is going to be constrained you know, much smaller than unity. So there's Non-Gaussian energy arises from some non-linearity in the interactions, and as I said, from sub-Hubble interactions in models with higher-order derivative terms in the Lagrangian, you then get, you can get so interactions of the field. That's in the equilateral shape, and the non-linearity is proportional to inversely proportional to the sound speed in these models. So here you can produce these could be single-field models with significant non-Gaussianity, but um, but it's in the equilateral configuration. And, in and these should respect, if they're single field models, they should respect the general uh, constraint on the local squeezed configuration of nonlinearity being small. So nonlinearity in the squeezed configuration, the local form, only, only arises from superhubble evolution. And you only get superhubble evolution of the curvature perturbation if you've got some non adiabatic perturbations in that large scale limit. And in inflation, that means, um, keyword I haven't said here is, that's going to have to, we have to have multiple degrees of freedom uh, for the perturbations. So you can have some relative perturbations between uh, two or more s uh, scalar fields during inflation. So um, now still, during inflation, if you're doing sl cannot slow roll inflation, the interactions tend to be small. So typically, these are tend to be small during inflation. You have to look for exceptions to that, that rule. But after inflation, or at the end of inflation, models which modulate the reheating, his, the reheating history of the universe, you can get uh, large uh, non-Gaussianity. And I've written this down, FNL should be FNL local in these models. Uh, in the example of something like the Curvaton model, uh, then this uh, F FNL is inversely proportional to the omega, the fraction of the critical density in the curvaton when it decays. Let me tell you about that curvaton model briefly. I keep wanting to go to the computer. I actually have a remote control. I should use it. Um, so let me t tell you, this is just one of those many sources of non-Gaussianity -Gauss possible. Um, it's one of the first ones to, to, to be discussed. Uh, in fact, this paper by Linde and Mukhanov back in 97 talked about non-Gaussian, non non-adiabatic perturbations uh, in, a, in a scalar field. Uh, and the idea here is that if you've got a scalar field chi, which is a, a weakly coupled field, so decay is a late decaying field, decays sometime after inflation, if it's light during inflation, it's like any light field during inflation, acquires an almost scale invariant spectrum of, of perturbations. Um, and even if its energy density is negligible during inflation, if it's a massive field, once it starts oscillating about its minimum, it behaves like non-relativistic matter, like the, this is a classic sort of moduli problem uh, in the early universe, when these, these, if they're stable, these particles hang around and over dominate the energy density of the universe. Um, so the, the solution is that they have to decay, decay before nuclear synthesis, and what was pointed out in the, these curvaton type models is that when they decay, they decay into radiation, they produce a, a density perturbation in the total density of the universe. If they thermalize with all the other decay, you know, particles in the universe, then you've got, you get back to just adiabatic density perturbations in the radiation era. But, so if it's a massive scalar field, it's got a quadratic energy density, so naturally the sim the, you can think of a density perturbation associated with the curvaton field as, as having this simple quadratic form. And there, when that's transferred with some efficiency parameter, call it R, uh, that, that becomes a perturbation in the total energy density perturbation. And basically, the efficiency is just proportional to the fraction of the total energy density that's in the curvaton when it decays. So you've now got this overall coefficient R, but when you expand this out, if you now identify the linear term as the Gaussian part of zeta, and the quadratic term is the Gaussian part squared, this coefficient in R turns up as 1 over R in the, um, 
in the uh, second order term, and that's coefficient in the, to the second order term was what I called F and L. So now F and L goes like 1 over R, and if the curviton doesn't dominate the energy density of the universe when it decays, you can get a large non-Gaussianity. Even if it does dominate the energy density of the universe, you still get uh, F and L of order unity in this model. It's, it's not suppressed by slow roll parameters. Um, as you see, there's no, in this simple sketch that I've done here, there's no third order term. So in this simplest curviton model, there is no uh, extra term in the tri-spectrum from GNL. On the other hand, there could be self-interactions of the field, um, and so you can probe the self-interactions of the field through GNL and, and higher order correlators. So that's just one example of these you know, uh, ways that non-Gaussianity is sensitive to the, to the reheating history of the universe uh, in models such as this. So let me step back from the theoretical models a bit and just look at what we have here in terms of uh, what is, think a bit about what, the, what these models of non-Gaussianity are. And um, uh, Francois showed us a nice, a nice picture of what FNL, the local type FNL and Gaussian anti looked like. This is a slightly early version produced by Michele Aguirre and collaborators. Uh, first of all, a, uh, a Gaussian random field sky, which you're used to seeing. Um, it's an earlier one when the observational bounds were, were weaker. And so they also plotted out a much larger coefficient for FNL. So I can show you what FNL of 3000 is. Uh, it's when you remember, so what you find is a CMB sky with more two spots, right? So more cold spots in this CMB sky with a positive FNL. If you have a negative FNL, you get more hot spots. So if I just go back to, so for, if I go back to positive FNL, you see what's happening is the, uh, the potential here, with a positive FNL, every time you've got a peak in the potential, you're adding to it a term proportional to phi squared, and every, and every time you've got a, a dip in the potential, you're flattening out it by adding to it a bit plus for now squared. So you get these more cold spots. So it's quite nice to actually see, if you haven't seen it before, what, what these look like, I think, in the CMB sky. And it also emphasizes, someone asked, can you, you know, can you tell what the, what the sign of FNL is? Well, yes, you can. <laughs> you can see it. It's either cold spots or hot spots. It's quite nice. And the funny thing is, when I started, when I started looking at the curviton model 10 years ago, we were trying to work out the coefficient in this, um, uh, in, uh, in the, the second order term. And as theorists, it had never occurred to us that the sign of these things mattered. Because, uh, and in fact, it's a bit of a problem because, of course, um, there are all sorts of different sign conventions in the literature. And uh, indeed, many of you might, if you think about it, might be disagreeing with my sign convention here for what the Newtonian potential is. So and indeed, I've been talking about an over-density as being a positive uh, potential term here, which I'm afraid, Shiro, <laughs> is uh, the sign convention you picked, uh, which is, and, and theorists all then different sign conventions, but it's Bardeen's convention, that's right, so, but, but then <laughs> other people follow other conventions, and so, uh, but, but then of course you realize that why it matters is because it, it, it affects whether you get hot or cold spots, and that's why Shiro's um, convention is the one that matters because he's the guy that you know first went and compared against the data so all the theorists had to get their act together so that their predictions actually agreed with 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 what the observers measure so this so this very theoretical subject of nonlinear perturbation theory has actually become you actually suddenly have to worry about what the sign is which is must must be a must must be a good sign so um, from that, well, not from looking by eye, but as Francois emphasized, by actually doing matched template fitting, you can, uh, and indeed for FNL now, these are optimal uh, templates, uh, estimates of non-Gaussianity from the WMAP data. We get these constraints on, this is just the local uh, type uh, bounds, but you get similar bounds on, on other shapes for the bispectrum. For this GNL parameter, you notice the bounds are there, but if they're weaker. You might expect for the next term in our series. Um, so let me, let me got time to tell you about a little bit about another way of thinking about analysis in these models. Because I'm interested, and I've been thinking about recently, is that uh, another effect of of this in local type non-Gaussianity is that uh, what we're seeing here is a uh, correlations between different modes in your distribution. So what we have, if 
I hope you can see this. I haven't done it too dark. Hmm. If you split, um, so we're used to, to often uh, thinking about splitting a Gaussian field into, sorry, that's rather hard to see here, isn't it? Into a long wavelength mode and a short wavelength mode. So, okay, I've got a sum phi at some position, big X on a large scale, plus phi S, the, the small scale contribution. So, for the Gaussian field, these are independent. But now, um, the total Newtonian potential is actually includes a term from the square of these. So, when you look at the power on small scales, filtered on, uh, you can actually, s <laughs> you, this, basically from this quadratic term here, when I, if phi is Gaussian is equal to a bit from phi large scale and phi small scale, I've now got a, a, a term which is linear in phi long and linear in phi short. So, in effect, I've got a modulation, let me see it better here, so, uh, of the small scale power proportional to FNL times the large scale power. So, when you've got a peak of the long wavelength field, you actually get small scale modes, variance is larger uh, than it dips in, in, the, in the field. And so, um, so this is, as I say, is an, you can think of as an inhomogeneous modulation of the small scale power. Of course, on average, it's, you know, the large scale modes are up and down, so it's still statistically homogeneous if you look on an even bigger scale. But if you look at any finite scale, you can see this as an inhomogeneous modulation of small scale power. Now, FNL is bounded, is well bounded, less than 100 these days, so of course phi is about one part in 10 to the minus 5. This is a small effect on the overall modulation. I'm not explaining by you know, hemispherical asymmetries in the CMB sky here. I'm just pointing out, in principle, this is an effect. Um, but if you think about the higher order correlators, um, so start considering in a term, G G the GNL cubed term here, this has a similar effect on the inhomogeneous bi, bi spectrum. So I split my Gaussian field into long and short wavelength parts, if you can see it, and then I work out the three point function, and now I get a modulation of the three point function locally. And the coefficient, of course, is GNL times phi, plus in addition to the, to the average value FNL. <laughs> anyway, so you've now got statistical, in, you know, you've got local modulation of the bi spectrum. And the point is the G bounds on GNL are much worse. Um, so you've got the possible, this is something you can actually go and think about as being a possibility in, if you make estimates of FNL on local patches on the CMB sky, for instance, as indeed uh, needlet type analyses already do. Um, so it's just an interesting way to think about this, uh, the effect of these local uh, non-Gaussianity. And the practical effect of this has already been realized um, as an ex uh, in, in actually going back to the power spectrum, this effect is, is important in, the, in affecting the bias of uh, the galaxy power spectrum. Uh, because this peak back, this long wavelength, long wavelength, short wavelength split in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Gaussian field is a standard approach in structure formation when you're thinking of galaxies as forming from local peaks so these stars are halos collapsing at peaks in the, the power spectrum on, on small scales, and you get a bias, and it's, it's known since the work of Dick Bond and others in 1987, that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the peaks, the galaxies are more clustered from this effect. You get a bias in the delta for the galaxies, the, the fractional density perturbation of the galaxies relative to the dark matter, because the long wave, because of this effect, even in a Gaussian field. But now, the Poisson equation, if we use the, this is for the density field. So I've given you a local model for the Newtonian potential phi, and that's related to the density field for, by the Poisson equation, so there's a Laplacian sitting here. So in fact, a local form for phi, when you write it in terms of the density perturbation, you get a very non-local looking uh, form uh, non-Gaussianity for the density field, and when you look at this modulation of small scale power from the long wavelength modes, you get a coefficient which is FNL, and then the Hubble scale relative divided by the, or the, by the, the wave number K. And so you get a very strongly scale dependent bias. Seven, seven. Uh, okay, thanks. And, uh, and, the str and the scale dependent bias um, blows up, indeed, apparently, as, as, as on very long wavelengths. It certainly becomes large as you approach the Hubble scale here. 
And this effect was pointed out by Dalal and collaborators in 2007 and has turned out to be a very powerful probe potentially or looking at the, if you can constrain the power spectrum of galaxies on the, on the largest scales, you get a very, can also get strong constraints on these F local type non-Gaussianity. Um, and so these are the sorts of bounds on FNL obtained now from large scale structure surveys. Um, that's a classic sort of references that of Slozar, 2008. But even claims in some of the uh, of, of, of two sigma-ish detections um, from a clustering of, of active galactic nuclei. So in fact, this effect is, is largest for the most biased uh, traces of the, the density field, so, which is why people are looking for, for very massive halos that are high, expected to be highly biased. So um, this small-scale modulation actually turned of the, sorry, large-scale modulation of the small-scale power turns out to be a, a strong constraint on these models from large-scale structure. Um, and uh, just to sort of, ah, but the other interesting thing, of course, was to say is that, of course, this effect, you can see it in that equation, it comes out with a term which is like the Hubble scale H divided by the wave number K. And uh, you might be worried, so it's interesting that this um, structure formation sort of effect becomes large up on the Hubble scale. And so theorists are having to think seriously about whether you trust this simple model that I gave you, argument that I gave you based on Poisson's equation, for instance, a Newtonian looking uh, approach to gravity, but does it apply up on the Hubble scale? You know, surely general relativity plays a role here. And that's what this sort of graph is showing, that if you, um, the sort of classic uh, power spectrum for a, a, a and galaxy power spectrum for a scale invariant uh, initial perturbation spectrum would be the solid black line. Um, a model of non-Gaussianity is actually this red dotted line um, is FNL of about 0.63 actually and you get this, if you can get up to very large scales, a very large effect. Of course, um, therefore you have to realize that all the signal is coming in the constraints like this is coming from the largest scales in the survey and that's of course the scales on which you know you have to work very hard to um, so there's lots of systematic problems potentially in, in the constraints that gives you but but as I said there's also a question as to whether the theory is right up on that scale so for instance this plot also shows uh, the density perturbation calculated in different gauges uh, this is solid line is the co-moving density perturbation whereas uh, the the blue dashed line is the density perturbation in the Newtonian longitudinal gauge, right? So these gauge effects become important up on the uh, of order of the Hubble scale. And um, so, uh, so, and you just have to think more carefully about actually how you make observations on these large scales. So that's a very interesting area. And it's partly the focus on non-Gaussianity and this effect that's uh, because the constraints from non-Gaussianity come from these large scales that it's pushed the theorists to think more carefully about how we make predictions on that scale. So this is uh, work uh, done recently with Marco Bruni, who's here, and other collaborators from Portsmouth. Um, and so you have to think about calculating galaxy bias, They're doing this cal calculation of galaxy bias in general relativity, not just in Newtonian gravity. Um, even bias itself is a gauge-dependent quantity because it's a ratio of two gauge-dependent things, the uh, galaxy density perturbation and the matter uh, density perturbation. Um, but the answer is, I think, that GR does work, at least linear uh, re general relativity. Of course, we do have a Poisson equation, as long as we're careful about what gauges the quantities are used in. In linear perturbation theory, cosmological perturbation theory, the Poisson equation is between the density perturbation in the co-moving gauge, the co-moving synchronous gauge, and the Newtonian, uh, the Newtonian gauge metric perturbation phi, and spherical collapse, well, is, is local collapse, at least if it's spherical, is something we also know how to do in GR. And again, the collapse criterion is when it's the co-moving density perturbation reaches a critical value. And so uh, this simple prescription for bias, the Newtonian type prescription for bias, does work in general relativity, as long as you're working with quantities defined in, in the density perturbations defined in the co-moving synchronous gauge. Uh, and there's also work by uh, Zaldariaga, 
and collaborators uh, recently on that subject. So we can uh, say what the galaxy power spectrum looks like in different gauges, and we can turn that into the angular galaxy power spectrum observed at a given redshift, um, and there's some nice papers by Anthony Chaloner and Anthony Lewis and Camille Bonvan and Ruth Dura, uh, and, and you and collaborators as well, also showing how to actually make consist do the same sort of consistent general relativistic analysis of large-scale structure as we're used to doing for the CMB. Um, so I think non gaussian energy is making, you know, is prompted uh, interesting work on this, and we've got to get these things right or else we, we, we would miss, you know, make, miss, make an incorrect prediction for the large-scale uh, galaxy power spectrum in non when trying to test non gaussianity for instance. So uh, lots of statistics beyond uh, FNL. Um, you can look for higher order correlators. You can look for scale dependence of, of FNL. You can look for non-Gaussianity in perturbation spectra other than the adiabatic density perturbation. There could be isocurvature modes that you only see through their non-Gaussianity, or at least you can constrain through possible non-Gaussianity, magnetic fields, uh, and, and so on. The outlook, of course, is Planck in the first instance. Um, could we get bounds on FNL down to five? That gives you lots of space for future discoveries. And of course, large-scale structure constraints, um, just how, you know, there's a lot of interest in how good the bounds on non gaussianity you could get uh, from future large-scale structure surveys. So great potential for discovery, lots of scope for theoretical ideas, because, well, I think it's worth pursuing theoretical ideas as long as they can be tested by uh, the observations, right? And uh, there's more data coming. That's what makes it interesting. And at some level, uh, we will see non-Gaussianity. I overheard Francois saying to someone, there is non-Gaussianity in the, s in the signal. And I, my ears pricked up. But of course, he was saying, there is non-Gaussianity in the signal. There's all sorts of foregrounds. There's non-Gaussian sort of effects in here, right? Um, so at some level, we're going to see it. And of course, I'd be I hope that we might see it, identify some of it as primordial. Thank you. Indeed. <laughs> That's right. Question. You showed a nice picture of uh, describing local non gaussianity by talking about uh, low frequency modulation of high frequency mm -hmm. Can you give similar physical pictures in real space for other momentum space configurations like equilateral or cosmos? And I think that what you gave is for the squeezed local. Non squeezed local isosceles? Well, uh, yeah, I was using local and squeezed uh, interchangeably. So, so the local form that I was talking about, where it's a local function of a Gaussian field, uh, so a possibly nonlinear function of a Gaussian field, then that gives a maximum in the, in the squeezed configuration. Um, so uh, there are, yes, so, uh, so it's what I talk about this large, small scale modulation is, is specific to the that local or squeezed form, but uh, Anthony Lewis has, in particular, has talked about how you should could visualize the other other types of bispectrum. So he has a nice paper on the shape of non-Gaussianities. Uh, Yeah, so, well, as I said, you have to have some self-interaction term, really, to get a significant GNL. There is, just from, just from doing the second-order general relativity, there's, there is a GNL term that I didn't, doesn't appear in the analysis I did there, but if you do it more thoroughly, you do get GNL of order FNL. But given that the bounds on FNL are so tight, uh, we're not expecting to get any, any signal from that a similar value of GNL. Um, but you can, there are models where um, the, the curvaton has significant self-interaction. And uh, there you may get a cancellation in FNL where it just, it by chance is small, and the first signal, the big signal comes from GNL. So um, 
so, it, so it, what you're seeing if you see JNL, it's, an, it's a signal of self-interaction. Um, so in a sense, I would see that as you know, going beyond the simplest uh, uh, Curviton model, but, but Enquist and collaborators have certainly argued that at some level, self-interactions are going to be there. This field does decay, so it does couple to other fields, so it will have some, you can calculate some self-interactions of the field, and so there will be some, that that's, would show up in JNL. Any other stop here?